بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ومولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما لعن الله الظالمين لكم من الأولين والآخرين وألحقهم بدرك الجحيم قال الإمام الصادق سلام الله عليه إن عمي العباس كان نافذ الإيمان صلب العقيدة بذل نفسه في نصرة أبي عبد الله الحسين صدق إمامنا الصادق سلام الله عليه صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Tonight is regarded as night of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas according to the nights of Ashura every night discussion usually is about one subject. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas has a great position. When we say our Imams, they are ma'asum, have a great position, we say, well, because they are Imam, they are ma'asum, they are infallible. But still we say, other than the 14 ma'asum, there are great dignitaries among human beings who have reached such high state, which is near to the state of ma'asum. And one of them is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salamullahi alayh. The other one is Ali al-Akbar, salamullahi alayh. And also Sayyida Zainab, salamullahi alayh. Or Fatima al Ma'asuma, Salamullahi Alayha, Al Qasim ibn al Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, or Sayyid Muhammad ibn al Imam al Hadi. There are many among the children of our Imams who have very great status. Of course, not all of them. And that is why those are remembered. And one of them, as you know, is Abu al Fadl, Salamullahi Alayha. And he was a presence in Ashura was planned by Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam when he asked his brother Aqil that choose a woman for me who was born from the brave tribes of Arabs so that I can marry her and she will give birth to a son who is a brave and he will support my brother, my son Hussein in Karbala. And Aqil said, well, the best one is Fatima bint Hizam al-Kilabiyya because Bani Kilab were known, so many um, brave people were among their lineage. And then Amir al-Mu'mineen married Umm al-Banin salamullahi alayha. But not only that, actually, special effect of inheritance beside he himself, Salamullah ala Abu al-Fadl, was at his said, Nafid al-Basira, Sulb al-Iman. Nafid al-Basira means his awareness is very clear, very deep. His faith is very strong. Now, to be very deep in your vision uh, is actually the main point for people to prevent them from doing sin or from not doing their religious duty. As it is said, the knowledge, and when you say knowledge is the facts, knowledge is the facts which are 100%, otherwise it is not a knowledge, it is a doubt. The knowledge, though it is 100%, but its effect on a human being is not the same. There is ilmul yaqeen, only knowledge about something you are certain. We know that there is hellfire and there is punishment in the day of judgment. But that knowledge has no effect on our soul. 
no effect on our, our deeds in this world. Many people disobey and they don't care. You say, don't you believe in day of judgment? You say, yes, of course I believe. Don't you believe that there is punishment for the sinners? You say, yes. You say, but why do you sin, um, do sin? You say, well, it is okay. You take it easy. So his knowledge has not affected his practice. Though it is knowledge. So here, you say, his vision is not very deep, not very clear. And there is a state of yaqeen and al yaqeen. It is a state when you see the fire in front of you. Now, naturally, you are afraid. If somebody tell you if you cross this road or you cross the traffic light, you will be thrown in this fire, naturally. You are scared and you will not disobey. And when you are inside the fire, naturally your certainty, though it is 100%, but now you feel and since your all senses and all nerves of, of you, they feel the effect of fire and burning. Not only you hear fire is burning. Yeah, well, you know it, it is burning, but now you feel the burning sensation. Now to be very, very clear about things, when you need that depth of basira, depth of vision. And that what make a person near to the ma'asum, I mean asmat in a practical way. Well, that is what we say, wajib al asma is obligatory, infallible. That is 14 ma'asum and well, the prophets, peace be upon them all, were infallible. But then other people by practice they are ma'asum in the sense that they are not doing anything by practice. Though they have the same willpower and the same selfish desires that we have, but they do not obey their desires and they themselves obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have that clear vision. So Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, when it mentioned about him, was, I mean his vision were very deep. He knows about the greatness of Islam, greatness of his father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, as a vice gerent of the Holy Prophet, greatness of his brothers, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, being Imams uh, on mankind, and he has to follow them, even if he is their brother, but still their position to him, like position of a, a leader to his people. So he looked to them with that respect and with that understanding. And that is why when he used to talk to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he do not say brother Hussein, no. he says Sayyidi, oh my master, Aba Abdullah. He talk with respect because he know that Hassan and Hussein are Imams, not like other brothers, you know. He may have other brothers like Muhammad ibn al Hanafi was also his brother. And from his mother's side also he has three more brothers, but his way of dealing with them was different than when he deal with his imam. In imam, he deals with complete submission to what he says, because he knew imam, what says is right 100%. There is no argument. Now, theoretically speaking, we say that, but practically, you see, the people were not like that. Many people, many sahaba, they know the Holy Prophet is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Still, when he says something, they argue with him. They have a comment. They say, this is right, that is not right. This, do this, don't do that. So they have doubt about prophethood, not very clear about it. So theoretically, if you ask them, you say, yes, we know. Okay, so why in a practice you do not follow? There is no answer. You see, because that depth of vision is not there. And what we need is that depth of vision. And to be serious about our Iman, when you say it is halal and we have to do it, uh, or wajib, we have to do it, then we have to be serious about wajibat. But they say, okay, today I pray and one day I'm tired. Okay, I prayed my life and one day I will not pray. What will happen? No, it is not like that. Today now is hot, I will not fast. You know, It's not, not possible like that. If we see some haram things, we say, okay, this little haram is okay. You know, big haram I will not do, small sins I will do. That it is okay. 
Well, this is lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of vision, which will bring the person to do that. If we would have known effect of sins in very clearly, like we see the fire burning very clearly in front of us naturally, we will not be sinful. One example of that, when the Holy Quran says about backbiting, you say, don't backbite, do you like to eat if dead flesh of your a brother, you hate it naturally. So now, if you see a, your brother dead, naturally you will not think even in mind, will not imagine, will not try, and you will not physically go and eat his flesh. Impossible. Why? Because you know that is not possible to be done. You hate it very clear for you. Your vision is very clear aware. But backbiting, you look to it like that, say, no, I was doing backbiting of this and that, and nothing happens. It's okay, stories, no, we are talking. Spending time talking about this, about that, okay. Ill talking, no problem. So you see, we will not look to that as bad as this. That is why we may do sins. Well, all sins are like that, you know. The Holy Quran says for those who do not pay religious dues of their money, in the day of judgment, with those coins, they will be burned, their foreheads and their sides will be burned with that money in which they hold it and did not spend it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now if we use, if we usurp religious dues, we will not to look to it that it is so hot that it will burn me. No, I see it is cold and I can use it and usurp it and no problem. Nothing will happen. While if I know that it will change into fire and burning me very clearly, naturally, I will not hold it. I say, no, this is burning. Like I get away of filthy things because, let us say, it has bacteria, for example. Food, bad food, I say, well, it's fermented. I throw it away. It has value, money value, but then I say, no, it is spoiled, throw it away. Why? Because I know very clearly it is harmful to the body. So I will not look to usurping religious right like that. I say, well, it's okay, make no difference. Who cares about it? So to have that clear vision is what gives the person practical, what you say, asma to stop from doing any sin and to fulfill his religious duty. Even at the most difficult situations, one stand will not run away. And Abu al-Fadl Salamullah Ali had that status. Beside his ethics toward his Imams, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhum salam also his awareness that he has to respond to their call and whatever they say, he is submissive to them. Well, he was very brave from his childhood. Well, his birth was probably in the year of 24, 26. Uh, different historians mention different. If it is 24, then in the Battle of Safin, his age was 12 or 13 years, you know, or maybe less than that. Uh, in Ashura, his age was 37, so probably 24 was his birth, you know. Sophine was 36, 37. So his age was 12, 13 years. Amir al-Mu'mineen said to Bani Hashim, you do not go and fight, you know, because he knows Bani Hashim, the Hashimites are very brave. And then people of Sham will come in a big number and will kill. So the progeny of the Prophet will not remain alive. All will be killed. So he prevented Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Abu al-Fadl, and other Bani Hashim they said, you don't go to the war front, don't fight. It looks one day Abu al-Fadl was standing in the front side, and somebody from side of Sham, he said, he found a, well, a small boy, well, 12, 13 years, said, do you want to fight with me? Well, Abu al-Fadl felt he had to say no, and they say that you are coward, you are not a brave. He said, okay, if you like, come forward. When he came, then he killed him right away. Then a the second one came, they said, 
they were sons of Abu Sha'tha, has seven sons. He killed them all till the father came to fight with him. Amir al-Mu'minin was noticing the scene and he found his son Abu al-Fadl is there and someone who is very brave has come and now he is at that age, uh, cannot fight with that man and probably a risk will happen to him and Abu al-Fadl is reserved for Karbala, is not reserved for this war and still he is young for that. He came, Abu al-Fadl said, I will get permission, that was the usual say, to get permission to fight, you know. So he came to Amir and he said, well, this man called me to fight. Amir said, no, I told you not to fight. Come and change your dress with my dress. So Amir and got the dress of Abu al-Fadl and naturally they close usually their face and he went there. That man said, did you, he was just joking, did you get permission from your Imam that you believe is Imam? Amir al-Mu'minin said, well, permission is given for Imam. He replied a general reply. And then with one shot, he killed him. Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As were looking there. They said, this is not of any ordinary person. This is impossible in such a, in, in, in a seconds that he cut his head and his body into half till the sword come to the uh, back of the horse, you know. It's not an ordinary man can do it, you know. Only Ali, but Ali was not fighting here. Ali was inside, so how come Ali has come here? Said Amr ibn al As said, if you like to know, ask all the army to attack. Well, 70, 80,000, all the army, start the attack. He said, if he's Ali, Imam Ali will not run away. He stand there, he will not care. Well, any other brave man, he would come back till he join his army, so his army will support his back, and then he can fight from the front side, you know. Well, Imam Ali stood there alone, and he started fighting them alone till, well, his people came and supported him, and later on they realized that he was Amir al-Mu'minin, alayhi salam. However, Abu al-Fadl was brave from that age, and it was shown well, like all Bani Hashim were like that, actually. And at the time of Imam Hassan, alayhi salam, when they, Imam Hussein tried to bring the janazah for visiting the grave of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bani Umayyah gathered and said, no, we will not allow. They thought they are going to bury Imam Hassan beside the Holy Prophet. First of all, why not Imam Hassan? should be allowed to be buried beside his grandfather. Why Abu Bakr and Umar were allowed? They are foreigners to the Prophet and his grandson is not allowed. Well, that is one of the injustice point of Bani Umayyah. However, they throw the janazah of Imam Hassan with arrow and Abu al-Fadl was standing beside his brother Imam Hussein. He took his sword out to attack them Imam Hussein told him that, no brother, it is will of Imam Hassan not to get even a drop of bloodshed. We'll have patience and you have another role in Karbala. This is not your day. Well, Abu al-Fadl was patient and uh, he did not uh, say anything and tolerated all that injustice done to the body of Imam Hassan alayhi uh, salam from Bani Umayyah. We see in Ziyarat of Abu al-Fadl, and Ziyarah, you know, is from the language of Ma'sumin, when they say here, start with Salamullahi wa Salamu Malaikatihi al-Muqarrabin. Start with the peace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his favorite angel, angels. Angels are not all of them Muqarrabin who are nearer to Allah. Not all of them are that, only very few of them, let us say Jibrail, Mikael, Israfil, Azrael, those are the near uh, ones, you know, so he specifically said about these angels, their peace uh, is upon you, uh, O Abu Fadl al-Abbas. And he said that I am a witness that you have submitted to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are honest in acceptance 
as a true loyalty and sincerity with regard to the descendants of the commissioned prophet. So those loyalty, sincerity, honesty, submission, all such great uh, titles given to Abu al-Fadl sallallahu alayhi by the Imam here. And then it is said in, in other place, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ مَضَيْتَ عَلَى مَا مَضَى بِهِ الْبَدْرِيُّونَ I am a witness that you have gone through the same path that those who fight in the battle of Badr and other Mujahideen in the path of Islam have gone. So he's comparing him with that uh, completely. So that excellence and greatness is mentioned by Ahlul Bayt Salamullah Alayhim about Abu al-Fadl Salamullah Alayh because of his greatness. Well, when the movement of the caravan of Imam Hussein started, actually Abu al-Fadl Salamullah Alayh was taking care of his sister Sayyida Zainab Salamullah Alayha. She also was feeling peace and satisfaction to see her brother Abu al-Fadl is protecting her. Well, it is a long movement from Medina to Mecca about 500 kilometers, it took uh, about 10, 15 days. And then from Mecca, when they came to Karbala, about more than a thousand kilometer, it took another about 15, 20 days, you know. So a lot of risks are in the way, but the still heart of Sayyid Zainab was satisfied with the presence of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salamullahi alayhi. In the night of Ashura, I mean, ninth at night evening, uh, Laylat Ashura, Imam Hussein alayhi salam was sitting and he hear that the army of Umar ibn Sa'd is attacking his army. A movement is there. He sent Abu al-Fadl salamullahi alayhi and he said, اذهب بنفسي أنت or اذهب بنفسك أنت you yourself go and ask them what do they want. Abu al-Fadl went with about 30 people like Habib ibn Mudahir and similar great personalities and asked them, what do you want? They said, we got the order tonight to fight with you. He said, okay, stay. I will ask my brother Imam Hussein. He came and told him, Imam Hussein said, ask them to wait till tomorrow because we want to pray tonight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much Imam Hussein is giving value for a prayer that he wants to stay one more night in his life in order to pray more and more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, Abu al-Fadl returned and asked them to wait till morning and they waited till next day morning. That was the day of Ashura. In three days before Ashura, probably more than that, about seven days because they were on third day, water was banned from the caravan of Imam Hussein. And Abu al-Fadl salamullah alayh was usually the one who used to go and attack and get water and come back. Well, because it was not a serious war, so there are 100, 200 people, then he could get the water from them. And in, in all those nights, it was duty of Abu al-Fadl every time he will go and he will get water for the children. Till night of Ashura, then completely water was banned and they were not allowing a drop of water to come to the caravan of Imam Hussein. Some said three days, some said one night. Well, maybe little water was brought and it was not sufficient. Well, different historians write different things. However, in the day of Ashura, which was very hot, sunny day, and the war started, Abu al-Fadl salamullah alayhi was carrying the main banner of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And at the beginning of the battle, when army of Omar ibn Sa'd started throwing arrows toward the army of Imam Hussein and some of the arrows came to the tents of the women. Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, well, 
you stand for war because these are the messages of the people to you. The message is message of war to you. Because Imam Hussein did not start himself war at all, you know. He hated to start the war, to be the first one to begin the war. Even when he met Hur bin Yazid in the way before reaching Karbala, Hur was with, his, with 1,000 uh, soldiers and it was easy to kill them all. But Imam Hussein said, no, I hate to start any war. Let them start it so they are transgressors, not me. And here, when they started the war, Bani Hashem said, well, Imam Hussein is our relation and we have to start the attack. Till we are sacrificed, then the companions of Imam Hussein, Ansar, will have their role. Ansar said, no, you are the honored people, grandsons of the Prophet, the progeny of the Holy Prophet. We should be sacrificed first for you. When we are all killed, then you start the war. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they came to Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein said, okay, let Ansar start the war. When all Ansar, about 72 people were martyred, then the first one who started from Bani Hashim was Ali al-Akbar, salamullahi alayhi. And then all 17 people were martyred one by one. Abu al-Fadl noticed that no one remained except his brothers. He had three brothers. Abdullah and Ja'far and Uthman. So he told them, okay, it is the turn for you. And he, with his brothers, they attacked the army of Ibn Sa'd. And there, his brothers all were martyred there. So no one remained with Imam Hussein except Abu al-Fadl, salamullahi alayhi. He came asking for permission. Imam Hussein find it very difficult how to permit Abu al-Fadl to leave. He said, oh brother, you are carrying my banner. The women are satisfied. Still they feel some sort of safety if they see you alive. They know that you are the one who will protect them if any danger comes to them. So how come I allow you to go and fight? He said, well, I cannot tolerate waiting when I see all the cruel act they have done. He said, well, if it is like that, then go and bring some water for the children because the children are very thirsty. They were crying, al-atash, al-atash, thirsty, thirsty. And Abu al-Fat, salamullah alayhi, when he heard them, he took the skin and attacked Euphrate. It is said there were 4,000 people and he alone attacked them bravely till he reached the water of Euphrates. And then he filled the water skin and got some water to drink. Then he remembered that his brother Imam Hussein is thirsty. He said, no, I cannot drink water before my brother. Some historians said that Amir al-Mu'mineen once he told him that, oh, my son, if you one day go to Euphrates and you, want, you are thirsty and you want to drink water, remember that your brother Hussein is thirsty, don't drink water. Whether it was that or he by himself remembered, whatever, Abu al-Fad, salamullah alayhi, threw the water out. And he recited a couplet that, oh, my soul, you should not be satisfied with water before Imam Hussein is satisfied. When he returned back, he was not fighting the army. He was just taking care of the water skin to bring water for children. But then Umar ibn Sa'd asked all the army to attack and prevent Abu al-Fadl from that. He was fighting very bravely till someone came from the side of a tree and hit his right hand. His hand was disconnected. Well, he took the sword with his left hand and recited his couplet that even if you cut my right hand, I will continue defending my faith. Somebody also came from the side, from behind of another tree, and he cut his left hand. Then Abu al-Fadl took the sword by his teeth and start fighting them. 
they were not daring to come to him even when he has no hands to fight. And then one of the enemies came and said, Ya Abbas, you were saying that who will come to fight with me? Now I am coming. He said, you come when I have no hands. That is not really a bravery offer, you know. He said, if you have no hands, I have hands. Then with the steel that in his hand, he hit head of Abu al-Fadl, salamullah alayhi. Then Harmala hit an arrow in the eye of Abu al-Fadl. Abu al-Fadl, salamullah alayhi, fell down to the ground, and an arrow came and destroyed water from the skin. Then Abu al-Fadl called Imam Hussein, Akhi Adrik Akhaq. Imam Hussein came very quickly, and Hamid ibn Muslim said, we find him that he came down of the horse, he carried something. I said, what is this precious thing, Imam Hussein, in the, at the middle of the war, is carrying this. And he walked a little while, and then he came down and carried something else. He said, I came nearby, and I saw he is carrying hands of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salamu alayhi. Abu al-Fadl told Imam Hussein that, oh, my brother, don't carry my body to the tent. First of all, because I feel death has come. Secondly, because I promised Sukaina and other children to bring water, but I could not bring water for them. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa siya'lamu alladhina zalamu ayya mun qalabiyyan qalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Allahumma anna nasiluka wa nad'uuk bi jalali wajhika al-kareem wa quranika al-azim wa bi muhammadi wa ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. أن تعجل فرج وليك صاحب العصر والزمان وأن تجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه ومن المجاهدين بين يديه اللهم املأ به الأرض قصا وعدلا بعدما ملأت ظلما وجورا اللهم انصر به الإسلام والمسلمين واخذل الظالمين والمجرمين اللهم اقض بهم حوائجنا ويسر بهم مطالبنا واشف بهم مرضانا واغفر بهم ذنوبنا ووسع بهم أرزاقنا وبارك بهم لنا في ديننا ودنيانا وآخرتنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا وارزقنا خير الدنيا والآخرة اللهم بحق بالفضل العباس وهو باب الحوائج اقضي حوائج المحتاجين ارحم شيعة أمير المؤمنين اشغل الظالمين بالظالمين واجعلنا من بينهم سالمين وارزقنا شفاعة أبي الفضل وأمه أم البنين يوم القيامة ولا أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات خصوصا العلماء والشهداء والصالحين رحم الله من يهدي ثواب الفاتحة قبلها صلوات